Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. I'm Sarah Hicks and thanks for joining me for the second episode of The Art of Conducting. Now, if you join me for the first episode, you know a little bit about the history of conducting, including how dangerous it can be. Well, if you're Jean-Baptiste Lully, that is, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, you definitely need to go see that first video. So in this episode, we're going to talk about what a conductor does, and that discussion really begins with the musical score. If you've ever watched a conductor and thought they were just holding things together or having a dramatic moment or just moving along to the music, well, there's a little bit of truth in that. But what a conductor does, first and foremost, is to study and know what they're conducting really, really well from the inside out. So they're able to guide a group of musicians to create music together with a unified vision. Does that sound like a lot? Well, it definitely is. And it all begins with the musical score. So let's start with the score and what it looks like and all of the information it contains. Here's a score of a very familiar symphony by Beethoven. You know that one. So let's figure out what all this information is. If you're a musician or read music, a lot of this might make sense already. But if you're not, you probably don't even know where to start. So let me take you step by step. So look down to the left column over here. This is a list of all the instruments that are playing. In this case, flutes, oboes, clarinets, bassoons, horns, trumpet, and timpani, and the usual complement of strings, which is first violins, second violins, violas, celli, and basses. Yes, it's in Italian and Beethoven was German, but Italian is the language of all basic music terminology even now. The order in which the instruments are listed is basically always the same, woodwinds at the top, brass and percussion in the middle, and the strings at the bottom. Each instrument has its own line, and the first piece of information is the clef, which is usually either treble clef for the higher instruments or bass clef for the lower instruments. Violas have their own weird clef, but we don't need to get into that. Violas tend to be weird anyway. Right next to that, we have the key signature, which tells us, well, what key it's in. In this case, we have three flats, and we're in C minor. You might notice that the clarinets and horns have different key signatures and that they say in B and in E flat. This has to do with the history of the instrument and changing crooks and it's super complicated. So maybe I'll talk about that in some later video. Okay, so next we have the time signature. In this case, 2-4, which means that there are two beats per measure and the quarter note gets one beat. Now, given that information, you might think that the conductor would beat this music in two. Well, you'd be wrong, because then we have to go over here to see the tempo indication. It says allegro con brio, which in Italian means fast tempo with spirit. Furthermore, this metronome mark says that a half note is at 108, meaning 108 beats per minute, which, if you're mathematically minded, means that the quarter note is at 216, so super fast. And furthermore, the fact that the metronome mark is given as a half note might suggest that you're supposed to beat the half note and not the quarter notes. Okay, so are you still with me? Because that's a lot of information. But wait, there's more. First of all, of course we have the notes that the instruments are playing, but we also have a lot of other information, including the dynamic indication or how loud or soft the instruments are playing. In this case, we see FF, which means fortissimo or very loud. If you look over a few bars later, we have P, or piano, which means soft. If there were two P's instead of one, guess what that means? Yep, very soft. Hey, you're really getting this whole score rating thing. And finally, we have this dome with a dot thing in the second bar called a fermata, which literally means stop. And in music, we stop and hold the note we're on. So that's just two bars of music. It's a lot of information. So the next question might be, if everyone is reading the same information, what's the role of the conductor? Or even more to the point, does a conductor even matter? First of all, only the conductor has all of this information in a single score. Individual instruments have their own parts. Here's the second violin part. As a musician, you can see what you're playing, but you may not know what anyone else is playing. The conductor is the only person with everyone's parts, and therefore the only person who knows how all of those individual parts need to work together, which parts go together, where the melody or the harmony is, what the shape of a musical phrase might look like for all of the orchestra. To put it another way, the conductor is like the head coach of a football team. 
The wide receiver may know exactly what route he's running and has some idea of what the tight end is doing, but the only person who knows what everyone is doing and when and how they do it is the head coach. So decision number one for the conductor. While we have a metronome marking after the tempo indicator, historical studies tell us that these markings may not have been Beethoven's. So let's just go by allegro con brio, which again means fast with spirit. The question is, how fast is fast? And then let's say we're still in the ballpark of the suggested metronome marking of a half note equals 108 beats a minute, which means the quarter note is 216. Do we really want to beat our arms 216 times a minute and conduct in two? Or beat our arms 108 times a minute and conduct in one? Next decision. What does fortissimo, or very loud, mean? I mean, I guess louder than plain loud, sure, but what even is loud? Should we imagine what very loud must have meant to Beethoven and the instruments he was working with? Or do we consider the size of the orchestra, or the hall, or your mood and energy of that particular day? And we finally made it to the second bar, where we meet our friend the fermata, which to remind you tells us to stop and hold the note. Now, musical convention says a fermata lasts twice as long as the note or bar it's sitting over, but that's not some sort of hard and fast rule. So, decision number three, how long do you hold the fermata? Two bars? Three bars? Longer? Shorter? Forever? And that's just the first two bars of music, on a score that's over a hundred pages long. And that's not even considering how we interpret the articulation of notes, or which instruments should be prominent or in the background, or how long the musical phrases are, or what the general mood of the music might be. Which all requires an understanding of how the harmonies work, what the structural components of the composition are, and the style of the era it was written in. So in a nutshell, what I do as a conductor is take all of those decisions I made and the information I'm taking in and communicating in those first few seconds of music and keep doing that for another 40 minutes or so as the orchestra and I perform a full symphony. It takes hours of preparation, great communication skills, and an unbelievable amount of focus, all things that I'll discuss in the next video. So you can see that a conductor does matter because they're the only ones with all the information in front of them and so they're able to make both overarching and very specific decisions about how music is shaped which is critical in creating music and if you imagine that each different conductor has a different training a different musical background working with a different orchestra and a different venue under different circumstances well, then you can see how even taking the very same notes and the identical information, each performance will be very unique and different in the hands of different conductors, as each one will bring a very distinct stamp to their craft. So let's listen to two brief examples of that very same Beethoven symphony, so you can hear for yourself how different a piece of music feels under different conductors. Same instruments, same notes, same indications for tempo, dynamics, articulations, everything, but two very different takes. Pretty amazing, right? So it's clear that conductors do matter in the performance of music, so the next question probably is, well, how do they do it? In our next episode of The Art of Conducting, we're going to explore the gestural vocabulary of conductors, everything from beat patterns to the movements that they make to indicate tempo, articulation, and dynamics and how different they are with each different conductor. If you like this video, make sure you give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you'll never miss another episode. Thanks so much for joining me everyone and I'll see you next time.